Hi, I'm Andrew Watson. Thanks for tuning in to my weekly guitar blog here on YouTube, where I answer questions that get sent to my guitar blog website over at andrewwatson.com. We're going to start off with a question from Duncan all the way from California, from sunny California. Uh, Duncan wrote in and says here, I've been trying to record my amp into my computer using an SM57, a light snake cable, and Audacity. My problem is that I can't get enough volume in the recording without using some kind of amplification effect after recording, even with my amp's volume on half of maximum. Where should I position the mic to get the best sound? And uh, he also says here, I've been trying to do this with a mic positioned roughly over the center of my amp speaker. Uh, also, if it helps, I'm using an adapter to make the light snake cable work with the SM57. That was my first thing that I thought of when I read your email, Duncan, is, uh, gee, how is he getting an SM57, which has the XLR inputs on it, uh, going to, you know, having that to work with a light snake cable. Now, first of all, if you're not familiar with a light snake cable, what a light snake cable actually is, is it's a cable that has a quarter inch, inch plug, just like your guitar jack on one end, and on the other end, it's basically got a USB uh, 2.0 uh, plug on it. So uh, basically what it's, it was intended for originally was for you to basically plug one end directly into your guitar and then the other end directly into your computer's USB port. Now, I'm not a big fan. I've used those types of cables before. I'm not a big fan on that sound, uh, mainly because I am not the kind of guy that's a big fan of any kind of direct input, be it with electric guitars or, or acoustic electrics or microphones or whatever. Even with two preamps, I'm not a fan of that sound. I think the only instrument that it really works quite well with is uh, indeed bass, but you know, you probably want to go through some kind of DI box and do that properly uh, rather than the, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, around the, the back road sort of approach that uh, Duncan is using here. Now, Duncan, first of all, uh, in all my experience with this, I'm not a huge fan of SM57s. If you're not familiar with that either, that's a, a very good microphone made by the Shure company. Uh, but it's, to me, it's a better mic on a guitar amp or a bass amp for that matter, live. So if you're working on stage in a club or in a bar or something, you know, most often find the sound man from the club will stick a SM57 in front of your guitar amp. Now, you've got to remember, when your guitar amp is on stage, I mean, that's going to be pretty loud, and that SM57 is going to be in a board, and he's going to be able to con completely control the level, uh, and it's not going to any kind of recording equipment. So... Uh, so, so far, uh, Duncan, I hate to tell you, you got two strikes against you there. Uh, wouldn't use an S SM57 uh, to record anything, uh, you know, personally. Uh, the light snake cable, uh, my opinion here, again, completely wrong application. Uh, and then his, this is sort of the third strike, just in my opinion. I mean, this is sort of my opinion. You know, this in a, a quarter will get you a phone call, I guess. But Audacity is not the kind of program I would use to do recording in. You can record in it. I mean, you know, it's free and it's got some okay features. It's kind of a mediocre audio editing suite in my opinion. Um, it's all right, but you know, there's that old saying, you get what you pay for, you know, Audacity's free. Uh, fill in the blanks from there. And that's not saying though that a lot of the other uh, free or shareware style of audio editor suites out there aren't really very good or anything like that. You know, there's some that are decent, but I'm telling you, like my personal opinion, I would not use that to do recording with. So this kind of brings us full circle around, well, you know, gee, what should Duncan and other people out there that are in Duncan's shoes, you know, same kind of scenario, want to get some good recording at an efficient uh, price tag and et cetera, et cetera. So my recommendation is to start with a stereo matched pair of condenser mics. Now you're going to have to probably spend anywhere from maybe 85 to about $110, $120, something like that. My personal favorite out of this whole batch of mics that's out there is uh, made by a company called Apex. It's their 185 series. It's a condenser microphone, so that it doesn't. Re it will require power, so you need phantom power with that. 
Uh, but what's beautiful about those mics is they got excellent pickup. They sound wonderful. Uh, they have a minus 10 dB drop down, so you can actually go and take that uh, uh, bass cabinet of yours and just crank up your bass. You can drop the signal down by 10 dB, have a nice fat attack, but yet you're going to be recording at a really decent level. Now, in my opinion, for digital recording, I like the peaks to be around the orange level of the meter. I don't like those peaks riding up into red zone. It's not like we're dealing with old analog, reel-to-reel, -reel, and tape methods, because those methods, you could go into the red a little bit. On the digital, in my opinion, I, I like it to go up to the yellow zone, and that's where I kind of like to sort of have it, you know, stop. Um, so the minus 10 dB drop down that's available on those Apex 185s, that's a, a great feature and you're going to get some really nice sound of that. Now, remember, those mics are definitely powered. You need phantom power for those. So you need to go and run them into some kind of small mixing board. Now, my favorite mixer in this uh, realm is the little Mackie 402 VLZ3 mixer. It's only about a hundred bucks or 90 bucks, somewhere in that range. It's an excellent mixer. I'm going to provide Amazon links uh, in the description box of this uh, video blog posting. So you can go check this stuff out. Uh, but that Mackie 402, you can't beat it. The thing is rugged. It sounds mint and it works fantastic. It's got my five star recommendation on it. I've used it for quite a while. I've used a lot of other mixers too, so I'm, this, I'm not just saying this, you know, in terms of the fact that I own Mackie products and I'm not endorsed by Mackie. Maybe they should uh, endorse me. I think some of these companies should actually endorse me. I probably sold a lot of products through these uh, YouTube videos, but hey, that's a whole other story. Uh, anyway, out of that Mackie, when you're leaving that uh, Mackie 402, uh, my favorite new device for converting the analog sig signal, because remember right now, we're dealing with analog signal pretty much exclusively here, but uh, to convert that analog signal into digital, you're gonna need some kind of digital uh, converter box that's gonna have nice high uh, conversion rate on it, and you can't beat the ART V2. It's a really nice little USB analog to digital converter box that thing kicks butt and it's dirt cheap it's about 65 or 70 dollars or something like that i will provide a link to that art unit as well that thing is super quiet uh, i think it's originally meant to be some type of a dj box or something like that for running out of turntables into your laptop or whatever if you're a dj at a club or whatnot but uh, that box is super clean has really high uh, conversion rate and i would definitely recommend it now, um, when it gets to software, oh wait, one thing real quick, before we talk about software, I wanna talk about mic placement. Uh, mic placement is crucial because if the mic is too far away when you're dealing with the uh, condenser mics, or if you do happen to have that minus 10 dB drop down, and I would definitely suggest that even on a guitar amp with a clean cha a channel sound, a guitar amp with dirty channel, you know, overdrive, or a bass, you know, any one of those situations, the only time I would not use the minus 10 dB drop down is if I was recording an acoustic guitar. And uh, let's get into mic placement real quick now. I always like to have a mic placed about, but right in center cone, I like that placement the best with the condensers, pointing right at that center cone, maybe about two or three inches off the uh, amp screen. And that applies to both bass cabinets as well as the uh, guitar cabinets. And I also like to have, this is exclusive for guitar cabinets now, I like to have another mic in the back of the guitar amp uh, situated maybe about, I would say, probably about five inches away uh, from the uh, speaker. Of course, not uh, off to the side from the magnet, uh, of course, but um, maybe, you know, about uh, three inches off the, ma off the magnet, pointing more or less at the cone there, and about five inches from the cone. Now, if you're dealing with bass and you're doing bass recording, I would supplement that mic in front of the bass cabinet with a DI signal. So I would do a direct in simultaneous to having the mic on the bass amp cabinet. So uh, let's move on to software next. Now in the world of software, if you're on a Windows platform, I would go with Adobe Audition. If you're on a Mac uh, platform, I would definitely go with Logic. Uh, if you got a lot of money and you love spending money on updates and all that jazz, you can go with Pro Tools. Uh, I 
I like Pro Tools. It's a great piece of software. It's got a lot of expense behind it once you get involved in all the updates and so on. Plus, there's you got to be a decent engineer to deal with that too. So hopefully this makes sense and uh, you know you can go onwards and forwards from here. I think I covered every element of your uh, questions here. Um, so definitely ditch the light snake cable, ditch the, M the SM57, and in my opinion, I wouldn't particularly use Audacity. I'd go to something a little bit more like, uh, like I mentioned, Adobe Audition, if you're on a Windows platform, or if you're on Logic, if, sorry, if you're on a, a Mac, go with Logic. Uh, if you like spending a lot of money, go with Pro Tools. If you uh, have any other favorite software that you want to comment in the comment section, I know there's a lot of people that are using Cubase and, uh, you know, Reason and some other pieces of software. Uh, you know, by all means, leave comments in the box uh, below because, uh, you know, I have my favorites and I know they work a certain way, but hey, other folks out there uh, might have a lot of other good ideas. So anyway, let's move on to the next question. So the next question comes to us from John out in Germany. He wrote in saying, is there any way of warming up without touching a guitar, both mentally and physically through the use of something like a grip exerciser, question mark? Uh, this is something I could imagine being very useful before lessons or when jamming with friends when I might not have the opportunity to run through my usual warm ups." Well, basically, um, if you have, let's say you have no guitar. So, you know, if you, you know, one thing that caught in me and there's two things that caught me in this uh, question. One of them was uh, the use of a grip uh, thing or whatever. It's, I, I know that that grip machine is, was popular, really popular in the 80s. Um, I never really saw the point of it. I don't know if it really, maybe it does help. I don't know. I never, I tried using one once. I thought that the pressure on it was really enormous. Um, you do not need strength to play guitar. You have to understand that. Like, you know, it doesn't take uh, the ability to lift a thousand pounds to be able to play guitar. In fact, the touch that you need on your fretboard is very light. If you look at some uh, really, uh, you know, shredder crazy players like maybe Satriani or, or Steve Vai, um, you know, these guys, they're using very light strings in most cases, uh, and you, when they're pressing down, they're not pressing down very hard. In fact, to get some of the amazing legato work, let's say someone like Joe Satriani would be using, you're not going to be able to do that with heavy gauge of strings, and you know, it does, certainly doesn't take a lot of pressure. So what it is is relaxation and uh, confidence with where your hand is going, of course, and of course uh, the ability to be very agile and flexible, have great deal of dexterity and coordination. Now all this comes really from having your fingers, your hand on a guitar. It's very difficult to do this without actual guitar in your hands and your fingers on guitar strings. Um, but there are things that you can do. Uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, exercise ideas is to, let's say if I put the guitar like so, is uh, let's say I, I get the forearm of my hand onto the uh, body of the back of the body of the guitar and take, uh, for instance, maybe a couple of fingers and decide that I'm going to move them. Like I'll go with my baby finger here, my pinky and my middle finger and uh, just go up with uh, index and ring. So let's say second and fourth, an index and ring, just like that, create an exercise to, well, <laughs> create an exercise to flip flop between them. See, now this is doing something different. This is not about strength like a, a grip master thing would be, uh, because remember, you don't need to be able to lift a thousand pounds to be able to play guitar well. Uh, you, you basically need the dexterity and the coordination. So what you're trying to do with any kind of a exercise like this, and it's almost like a mental exercise as well, but you're trying to burn the, the pathways uh, neurologically, let's say, to your fingers, and you, you, so you're selecting different fingering groups and you're trying to move them, and you're just placing your hand on a desk or a table or back of your guitar before you play, and you try to get your fingers to do movements that are those that you're thinking about at the moment. So a lot of it just boils down to you having a direction in your mind that you want your fingers to execute and then basically you start running through different patterns and so forth like that. Now, another thing you can do is a lot of visualization and you don't have to be around a guitar for that either. Um, there's an old saying, uh, and I can't remember if it's Howard Roberts or one of the other GIT instructors, uh, like, um, uh, trying to think of some of the other guys that were really big on that stuff uh, out there. There was Charlie Fector. Uh, he was a guy that was really big on that stuff. And, you know, I had some other uh, uh, teachers that were 
really more into the psychological end of guitar playing. Um, you know, Joe Diorio was, of course, a huge, uh, probably he was one of the, the biggest te uh, guys teaching that stuff when I was there. And in fact, he suggested a great book uh, to me that I, I really enjoyed. It was called uh, Drawing on the Right Side, I believe was the name of the book. Uh, a woman wrote it, and she, she's actually more of an art uh, book, but it, it uh, has very interesting elements in it, just directed wholeheartedly at creativity. So I would recommend that book. I believe it's called Drawing on the Right Side. I'll try and find it on like Amazon or something and provide a link uh, in the description of this video. But you know, this idea of a psychological approach and trying to utilize both sides of your mind, the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, uh, thinking that is both uh, creative and intuitive and uh, very um, abstract, uh, as well as working with the side of your mind that's uh, very mathematical, very logical. Combining those two has those two hemispheres of your mind uh, to be able to run through ideas that are creative and ideas that are also very structured, like maybe the structure uh, uh, geometrically of scales, arpeggios, and pentatonics, and so forth. Combine that information with uh, creative ways of jumping around the fingerboard to be able to execute them. Now, you got to realize that uh, visualization is often overlooked by people. They figure that, ah, you know, visualization, what's that? Sounds corny sounds like it probably wouldn't work it, trust me it does work but you've got to do it and do it in a very uh, methodical and very planned way you know go th go and run through your entire fingerboard uh, in let's say uh, G major scale but do not touch your guitar don't even let your fingers hit the fretboard just do it all in your mind you know just sit down in a relaxing chair close your eyes and try to play through every pattern of uh, something like maybe let's say uh, an A minor 7 arpeggio do that, then get up, grab your guitar, and try to play A minor 7 arpeggios. So if you don't know all the shapes, then maybe run through the shapes in your mind that you do. And if you perhaps don't know that, maybe you know triads, you know, you do A minor triad or something. But pick something that you do know, you have worked on, and you've got a very good sense of the geometry of the shape. Sit down in a chair and close your eyes and try to run through all the shapes across your fingerboard. It's an amazing uh, mental workout and it's phenomenal what it does for your playing. Now you got to realize that playing away from your instrument and trying different kinds of exercises, whether it's the exercise I had talked about with the moving different fingers, you know, which is more of a physical study or studies through visualization does an um, enormous amount of fantastic work. Uh, also, visualizing yourself performing if you've got uh, performance anxiety is a great way to get over your performance anxiety. Um, there's people I've worked with over the years that have been so nervous uh, before going and playing recitals or even just playing some of their first gigs that they're doing that they've got stomach problems, they've got anxiety issues. I even worked with uh, one guy at uh, quite a number of years ago who used to actually experience breathing problems. He, he had problems taking in a deep breath uh, before going up on stage and performing. Now, mind you, he was doing something more involved, which was basically solo guitar work. So, of course, it's more challenging to be on stage by yourself doing a solo piece than it is uh, you know, being involved with a group. But I have worked with people who have had enormous amounts of uh, performance anxiety. And trust me, doing visualization work and slowing your thoughts down does wonders for this area. So keep this stuff in mind. And again, uh, hopefully, John, that answers your question. Thanks for writing it. Now, um, so let's see here. Uh, this last question that we're going to be discussing comes to us from Gareth out in South Wales, out in the UK. Uh, he wrote in saying, I've been playing electric guitar now for many years, and I've recently started to learn about the theory behind the music, such as scales, modes, improvisation, and the names and notes across the fretboard. My question is, though, when playing a scale over a chord or a progression, what intervals in the scale should I highlight or target, and what are the tonal qualities of each of the intervals based off of a given root note? Well, first of all, let's start with the whole idea of tonal qualities. Uh, this is a very good thing to break down if you're not familiar with it. Uh, I would begin just really simple with perhaps something like a, uh, a major triad. So in a major triad, the uh, quality that moves across initially is major. That goes from the root to the third, and then from the third to the fifth, we have a minor. Now when you deal with minor chords, if, you, if I was doing A minor, 
for instance, the interval initially is minor from the root to the third, the minor third that is, and then from the minor third to the fifth is a major third. So we have different tonal qualities as we jump step by step intervallically through these triads. So I would suggest doing this kind of work with all of your chords. Do it with augmented, do it with diminished chords, do it with uh, the sevenths. So go through, let's say, you know, major seven, minor seven, minor seven flat five, uh, dominant seventh chords, of course. Uh, work through some of your favorite extended chords, like maybe the nines, elevens, and thirteens that you use a lot. And then, you know, break all that down. It's a very useful thing, at least to do a couple times in your life. Now, when we get over to the world of playing over top of chords and playing over top of changes, I always remember this one teacher I had ages ago. Uh, he talked about this idea called chord sandwiches, and it was really kind of a funny concept because uh, what his uh, concept was, and maybe what I'll do is I'll just play something like A major seven chord right here off fifth fret of the sixth string. And in that shape, this is a shape that goes from the uh, sixth string at the fifth fret, and then we have uh, a seventh degree and a third and a fifth up top here uh, that are on the fourth string, the third string, and of course also here up on the second string. And this little cluster of tones, or what we might call a chord sandwich, is all of the perfect notes for that moment of that chord. So if you're playing a jam and you happen to be on top of an A major 7, in this case, or any chord really, take that shape that you have there and play into those notes when you stop lines. So, you know, if it's A major, I'll probably be playing something like maybe basic uh, major scale, maybe major pentatonic. I might be playing a little bit of uh, Lydian or something. But I can play a line and I can stop on any of those tones out of that sandwich. And every time I stop, as long as I'm on one of those uh, notes of that chord shape, I know I'm on a good tone. And I found that a little bit easier to deal with than, you know, somebody, of course, there's, you know, all the jazz books and all the players out there, they all say, yeah, man, play into your thirds, play into your sevenths, uh, you know, play some fifths once in a while. I mean, that stuff is really easy to say, but it takes a long time and a lot of practice to be able to actually target those chord tones. Now, don't get me wrong, chord tone targeting is the essence of playing over top of changes. So as a set of changes goes by, like let's say, for instance, I have a chord progression, like I'll use A major again here. We'll go A major, C sharp minor, and then I'll play E major, and then I'll play D. So let's say that's my chord progression. in a progression like that where I got four chords, as I'm playing over it, I want to be able to target into each of those chords as they show up at the moment. Now all those chords do fall in the key center of A major. So A uh, major and C sharp minor and the E major, D major, they all are from the key of A major. So in one sense, the A major scale will work over top of all those chord changes. But the thing is, is if you can get in, you know, back to what I was talking about before, this chord sandwiches thing, uh, if you can kind of target into the notes of the chord of the moment, you know, so if I'm on A major, you know, and then I can move to C sharp minor, target that chord's clusters. Here's the next chord now, the E. That major third is going to be one of the nice notes in there. That's a G sharp, you know, when I'm on that E major. And then the last chord was the D. Just keep going through the changes. If you want to record it as a jam, record it as a jam, practice over it. If you want to just play chords, uh, you know, a lot of people who play guitar, you know, they'll just sit there and kind of noodle around. Uh, you know, in fact, that's a very popular guitar term, you know, for people who are sometimes annoyed with guitar players noodling, you know, so, but, uh, you know, fool around with it. Just uh, mess with things. Try to play into chord tones. But I mean, the ultimate practice really is to record short chord progressions uh, almost every time around on my Creative Guitar Studio YouTube channel that I'll go through uh, an example idea or talk about some kind of concept. I just did a big three-part series on Phrygian mode. I think for every one of those videos that I did it was in the three-part series, they all had jam tracks to them. I've got loads of them on that uh, on, on the uh, Creative Guitar Studio YouTube channel, so check them out. But use jam tracks. They're phenomenal for practice because, you know, a lot of times, 
sometimes uh, they're only maybe uh, two or four bars long and you can target into chords you can work on all these ideas so hopefully that helps you out but uh, anyway that's about all the time that I have for today so I gotta say thanks for watching and for sending in all the great questions thanks for your donations all your support and of course your interest in uh, following my guitar lessons here online so have yourself a great week I'll catch up with you next time and bye for now